Everybody wants to know about the future energy mix and how exactly uh, we're going to crack the climate change problem and in particular how we're going to crack it by creating an end game for the fossil fuels. Um, this big set of questions which uh, focus uh, people in the energy policy world and the company world has been given lots of answers. And the usual sort of answer is, oh well, the answer's wind, or the answer's solar, or the answer's nuclear. People always have a particular technology in mind to solve this problem. And that is the wrong way to think about it. If we are serious about phasing out the fossil fuels over this century, then we have to get realistic about what works and what doesn't work, what's going to happen in the fossil fuel world and what's going to happen in the new technology world and we need to think quite hard about what sort of policy framework would actually deliver the goods. We've had knee-jerk reactions, the energy vendor in, in Germany closing nuclear power and making room for building up to 13 gigawatts of new coal. We've had uh, particular pushes for uh, offshore wind and so on, but not much serious thought. And uh, we're all guilty. The analysis is typically short term. The NGOs campaign uh, relentlessly without thinking through often the economics of what they're suggesting, let alone the politics, and the companies uh, pursue their own interest. So what I'd like to do is first of all take a big picture view what exactly is the challenge we confront over this century if we're to get out of fossil fuels and address climate change? What exactly will happen in the oil markets going forward? And how will that play out uh, more generally? And then what are the new technologies going to do? What are the opportunities? How are these going to work into the frame? And then I'll turn to think about the policy framework. So let's start with the challenge. It's enormous. We face this century an increase in the global population from around 7 billion to perhaps 10 or 12 billion. That is more extra people than the entire world population in 1950, again, on top of the 7 billion we already have. And contrary to the wildly optimistic ideas that everybody would go through a demographic transition, they'd all go to having small families as they got richer. Uh, African women certainly aren't following that path. That's why the estimates have been revised up. And actually, there's no good e reason for thinking as people get richer, they actually will want to have less children. So we've got a huge number of extra people. Nearly all of them are going to be in Africa, India, China and Southeast Asia. And all of them are going to want energy. They're going to want heating, lighting, the basics uh, to enjoy even a reasonable standard of living. So the wall of demand from those three billion people is effectively a datum or fact which we have to take into account. So people who think that we're just going to carry on reducing the energy demand through this century are uh, essentially on a different planet from the rest of us. The second thing that's true is that we're projected to have a lot of economic growth through this century. And by that I don't mean China-style growth, I mean plodding on at 2 to 3% per annum. Cumulative growth rates are surprisingly scary. What they tell you is that plodding on at 2 to 3% per annum, which is lower than the global average is and has been for a long time, would make the world economy at least 16 times bigger by the end of the century than it is today. And if that happens, that's 16 times the consumption levels today. So you think about it. If you had 16 times your present income, what would you spend on it? And in particular, how much embedded energy and carbon would there be on that extra consumption? Now, we could add some more things, like we're happily uh, exterminating perhaps half the species on the planet this century as well, but let's just stick to the climate change for a moment. So that is the world against which we want to get out of fossil fuels, decarbonise, and now we have an ambition of 
that decarbonisation working to the extent that there will only be 1.5 degrees warming by the end of the century. So what's the backdrop to that? Well, a lot of environmentalists and uh, a large number of lobbyists, including the wind and solar advocates and indeed the nuclear industry, happily used to think that we're on our way to peak oil prior to the price crash in 2014. They thought that what was going to happen was the oil price would go on and on upwards from 100, 140, up towards 200 as we ran out of oil and therefore effectively we would decarbonise because we simply wouldn't have any fossil fuels left to burn and the much higher prices meant that we could pay uh, for the renewables because they'd be relatively cheaper. It was rubbish and it's rubbish still. We've got more oil, gas and coal on this uh, uh, Earth's crust than enough to fry the planet <clears throat> several times over. There is super abundance of fossil fuels. So that isn't going to work and uh, the long-term price of oil will probably carry on going down. I've just uh, finished a book which is coming out in March next year which suggests a long-run decline in the oil price from its current level, $50, $60 or so, uh, in the autumn of this year, a very, very high price by international standards. Recall that for a hundred years, between 1860, 1870 and 1970, the oil price actually fell slowly and continuously, despite two world wars, the entire fossil fuel century last year. Why? Because supply responded to demand. And we've got lots of supply to come. We've got Iraq, we've got Iran, we've got lots more from Russia. We've got the spreading of the fracking technology around the world. We've got the US outputs. We've got the uh, sophistication being applied to the Canadian outputs. We've got the African outputs. We've got the South China Sea. We've got tons of the stuff to come. And all the while, um, the demand for oil is uh, likely to be relatively weak, and that's a, a low price world. That's the world in which the new technologies have got to compete about. And what are the new technologies? Because the existing technologies aren't going to crack climate change. Not even the PWR nuclear reactor is going to crack climate change. We need new technologies. And the answer here is where we get optimistic. This is a crackable problem. We've got the digitalization of economies, 3D printing, robots, artificial intelligence, intelligence etc. Everything that's digital is electric. And what that means is, as the economies transform more generally, with the digital technologies, so too does the energy mix transform towards more and more electricity. And we're going to have electricity for cars and transport too, and we've got new materials to replace some of the petrochemicals coming. Then we've got new ways of generating electricity, not current generation solar, but next generation solar, opening up the light spectrum, using solar film, using graphene, using um, a, a whole series of nanotechnologies and others to capture that uh, uh, solar energy. We've got potentially new nukes, we've got small modular nukes, we've got next generation nukes, we've got a lot of geothermal possibilities, and then there's gravity, i.e. hydro, and there's quite a bit of that left as well. But the, the odds are that it's solar and possibly nuclear which fills these gaps. And they are going to be necessary because the existing technologies cannot crack climate change. So what do we do? Well, we can go on pretending that Kyoto and Paris type agreements fix this problem. We can do some sensible things like get out of coal rather than get out of nuclear, which is what the Germans have done. Or we can invest in the new technologies which really could crack this problem. It's R&D that counts. It's technology that not only uh, has to solve this problem, but probably will. And in that framework, it's our best chance of cracking the overall challenge, which is how to decarbonise with an economy, a world economy, with 10 billion people plus consuming vastly more than they currently do. Huge challenge, but uh, there is really no option. We have to try, otherwise we'll fry. Thank you very much.